Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Glad you could grab a seat in the time machine for Throwback Thursday. And in this one, we'll listen back to our conversations with a couple of Houston sports icons, Hall of Famer Calvin Murphy and Rice House baseball manager Wayne Graham. I had Wayne Graham on my mind since he turned 84 this week. So happy birthday, Wayne. But let's start with Calvin Murphy, who, along with Akeem Olajuwon, will present Rudy T into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. This seemed like the perfect time to listen back to my conversation with Murph since Rudy T just got elected and since he shared memories of Rudy, including a classic story from their 10 years together as roommates. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. When Murphy was asked about Rudy's Hall of Fame election this week, he said, quote, we cried together, we laughed together, now we're going to be in the Hall of Fame together. And don't get any better than that. And I can't agree with them more. We also talked Moses Malone and so much more. So without further ado, let's jump in the time machine. I want to take you back about 46 years to start off with. And if you can remember that far back, but you were drafted. A lot of Rockets fans might not remember by the San Diego Rockets. Exactly. Exactly. Do you remember what you thought when you first heard they were they were moving to Houston? And when did you find out about all that? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, Bob Breitbart was our owner at that time. Uh, great guy. Great guy. And I had gone to uh, Mr. Breitbart and I had asked him what was the possibility of me being a rocket for the next couple of years because I wanted to buy a home. And he told me I was going to always be a rocket. Well, two weeks later, the doggone team is sold to to Houston. And, uh, you know, he said I was going to be a rocket. He didn't say where. So I guess he didn't, he didn't lie to me. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was shocked. Uh, I got in San Diego, and I immediately fell in love with it. Bought a nice little home up on Montclair Boulevard and uh, ready for a good career there. So uh, with that being said, uh, after the team was sold and uh, I got to Houston, well, all was, all was forgotten and forgiven. What did you think when you first came to Houston? When I was in high school, the great guy Lewis, Hall of Fame coach, tried to recruit me to play at the University of Houston. And I told him at the time that I was never coming to Houston for any reason. And every time he saw me once I got to Houston, he said, you little SOB, you owe me four years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, I got to Houston. And once again, the first thing I did after I got acclimated, I got into the community and started immediately doing work with the kids in the community. I fell in love with it. They adopted me and it's been here 45 years. I thought you were going to say the first thing you did was get yourself a cowboy hat. It was it was a lot more of a country <laughs> town back then, huh? My, my head's too small for those big hats. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? You were drafted, and I believe you were drafted the same year as Rudy, right? You guys, you guys came yes. into the league together, right? Yes, we came in together. Rudy was drafted in the first round. I was drafted first in the second round, and and you know, of course, with my ego, that that bruised it. You know, first team All American three years, and uh, uh, I had originally wanted to be drafted by the you know the Buffalo Braves because you know playing at Niagara University, been in the, uh, the Buffalo Niagara fence here for four years. I wanted to stay around the area. Well, of course, they took John Hummer. And uh, I saw John Hummer some years later, and, and he, he said I sabotaged his career because the people in Buffalo never accepted him because they wanted me. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> but with that, with that being said, of course, uh, San Diego drafted me first in the second round. I had a, the opportunity to talk to uh, perhaps the greatest coach I had uh, as, a, as, a, as a professional, which was uh, Alex Hannum. And uh, Pete Newell was our general manager. They called me in and they assured me that I was going to be given an opportunity to play professional basketball, regardless of what all the propaganda of my size was about. They they had belief in me, they had faith in me, and uh, off we went. So, you know, I, I was very pleased once I got to understand professional basketball because all teams are not for all players. And the, and the Lord saw fit to put me with the right team at the right time so that I could show my ability to play the game. 
I never get tired of hearing stories about you and Rudy as roommates. Can you give me one of the <laughs> PG stories? You got one, something that we safe for kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think that, that that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Rudy Tomjanovich and I, of course, were very, very, very close. Uh, we roomed together for 10 years. Uh, we lived next door to each other for 18 years. Uh, my, my, uh, daughter is his godchild and his daughter is my godchild so we were very very close but we were two complete opposites uh you know they say opposite track that's what it was with rudy t and, and myself you know rudy t was a horrible horrible person to get up out of bed in the morning and i, I think they put me together with him just so i could be his caddy so you know i would have to cuss him and push him and prod him to get him up in the morning well this one particular time i just wasn't in the mood we were playing in atlanta and uh we had a day off uh before we played in in, in the garden so i tried to get rudy get rudy up because we were going to go to new york that, that early that day and rudy called me some unbelievable names so i took the hell with him so i let him go to sleep so uh we landed in new york he was still in atlanta sleeping and I called him from New York, and I said, Rudy, you better get up. He said, oh, 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 I'm right down in the lobby. I said, take your time. We're in New York. He was <laughs> 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 Well, let me ask you about Rudy as the player, because I, I think a lot of people forget how good a player he was. Oh, was, was absolutely. Was he the best small forward in Rockets history? Oh, yes. That, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, he played, he played the big forward for us. Uh, during my time, he wasn't a small forward. Hell of a hell of a hell of a rebounder, and was a pure shooter. Yeah, and and I took my time when I said that because I don't think people understand what when I say pure shooter uh, means. You know, you got a lot of people that can score, and you got a lot of people that can get hot. But Rudy T was one of those that every night his shot was on. You know, they talk about they talk about uh, obviously when you talk about shooters, then you're talking Curry and 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 Harden. Well, that's fine. You can't touch him. You know, when we played and, 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 and shot 50%, we had to beat people off of us to get our shot. Well, you can't do that today. So uh, when I compare Rudy to the players today, not even close. You know, anytime I needed me an assist, uh, I find Rudy T. And, and, and uh, off we go. You know, seven-time uh, All-Star. Uh, he was our captain. Uh, he did it all. Obviously, and, 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 and we got to talk about this, uh, his his – his his game not his game his his in the in his perception by people changed when he had that misfortune to to get hit by Kermit Washington and everybody thought that is what killed his career and that's not true because actually when he came back from that situation he rebounded and shot better than he did before it but he he I guess he played one more year and decided that that was enough but uh, hell of a teammate. Uh, hell of a friend, uh, the whole nine yards. You know, Rudy was one of those kind of an individuals that if you didn't want the answer to a question, don't ask him because he's not going to lie. He's not going to lie to you. You say he was a big forward then. Would would he be a stretch for you think today, or where where would they put without him? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, the, the greatest thing that could happen to any team today is to have Rudy T on the floor, being a pure shooter, and the fact that he can take you out twenty feet with that straight arm bank shot. And, uh, and set the world on fire. Absolutely, he'd be a stretch for. Well, before we move on from the old days, I, I do want to ask you about Moses Malone. Your friend passed away back in September. And, you know, a lot of people probably don't even remember Moses Malone today. You got to be probably at least in your upper 30s or older. How, how would you describe Moses Malone to, to Rockets fans and to NBA fans that never got a chance to watch him play? T- tell me about his game. You know, it's unfortunate that people thought basketball started when Jordan came in. <laughs> there was a whole brand of basketball before the Jordan era. But Moses was, in, in my opinion, in the top five of all-time centers. You know, he was MVP, what, three times? Uh, uh, he, he did it all. He's a basketball Hall of Famer. Uh, he, he was one of those individuals that, uh, as, as, uh, as a shooter, you'd want to put on the same side of the floor with him because he demanded, commanded, and and had to have a double team every night. And if you're on the same side of the floor with him, you can pat you can pat your stats. <laughs> and I learned that early. Uh, you know, Moses. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about about Mo, so you can understand who he was. We were playing one night, and uh, it, just before halftime, we were sitting on the bench, and he said to me, uh, "My foot's broke." What the hell do you mean your foot's broke? You got like 13 rebounds. He said, "Yeah, it's broke." 
Well, he had 19 rebounds that night, and at the end of the game, I'll be gone if his foot wasn't broke. Uh, today, you know, the player is out for six months. <laughs> you know? uh, and, 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 and most of them have told anybody his foot was hurt, more or less broken, and, and that's the way his whole career was. He was able to play uh, at any, you know, at, at, at any health problem. Uh, mentally, he was so so strong. Uh, players that had to go one on one with him was afraid of him. The, the, one of the greatest centers I had the good fortune of playing against was Jabbar, and Jabbar could do absolutely nothing with Mo. Mo was too strong for him, and, and so anytime they matched up. One of the reasons why we were able to beat the Lakers when they were, you know, the Lakers of the Showtime era was because Mo controlled the inside. Mo was a tough guy as a sometimes with the media. He he had his moments, but you knew him as a person. What, what, okay, what, let, let, me, let me stop you for a minute. Yeah. I'm going to tell you why he was a tough guy with the media. Yeah, yeah. He got tired of people making fun of the way he spoke. He was, you know, Moses, you know, uh, uh, people took, you know, the way he spoke as him not being an intelligent individual, which was far from what he was. And, and the media sometimes was very mean to him. And he took it personal. He was a very sensitive, uh, you know, very kind, very boyish type of an individual. And he just wasn't ready for, the, you know, the way uh, the media could, could embrace or attack you, depending on the situation. And this is one reason why he shied away a lot of times not wanting to talk to the media or he was abrupt with them. Is it just completely crazy to you now how the game has evolved? And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I couldn't play in today's game. Number one, I'd fall out in five minutes because you can't touch anybody. That's the, first, that's the first situation. But when you start talking about the style of the NBA game today, yes, it has been. When they, when they put that three-point line down, the game changed forever. Uh, that's all the game is consisted of. And, I, you know, of course, I don't understand it. I made a Hall of Fame career out of shooting an 18-foot jump shot. I went for quality instead of quantity, where, as today, people are, are excited about the home run shot being a three-point three point shot itself. And with that being said, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a big man uh, to win the, the big games anymore. Of course, you know, Tim Duncan would tell you that's wrong since he's won five five rings and he's still going strong in today's game. But everybody is, is, is facing their offensive uh, uh, situation on the three. And then, of course, you got people uh, like Curry that, that just just a phenomenal shooter. You can't touch him, so no way you're going to ever stop him. So I don't particularly like the NBA game today. It's, it's too small for me. It's the, 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 the officials control too much of the game. You, you, you know, you, you got uh, doggone 45, 48 free throws a, a night, which I wouldn't mind shooting it during my era. But, but you know, the game itself is so toppy. Uh, I, I would like to see some of these players today that are today's stars and heroes play during the era where every night they were hanging on you. Every night you had to find a way to, to if your job was to get 25 points, to get it without the help of the official. Uh, James Harden, uh, 14, 15 free throws uh, a night. Uh, and, and that's no knock on James, but, but the fact that the bumping that we got during the time would not allow us to get to the line where he, you know, he gets bumped and he goes to the line all night long. So, you know, that's a little jealousy. Uh, with today's game, but but the but the game itself uh, is 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 not a pure game anymore. Well, you know something about shooting. Let me ask you: Is Steph Curry the best shooter that you've ever seen? No. Who's the guy? Well, there's a bunch of them. There are so many people that can shoot the ball, but depending on how the, how the referees allow the the bumping and holding to go from night to night. Let me be egotistical. I, you know, I shot the ball as well as is uh, is Seth. Uh, uh, Curry, uh, Pistol Pete, who was my all-time everything, shot the ball just as, as good uh, as, as as Curry did. Uh, downtown Freddie Brown was a from Seattle was a hell of a pure shooter. Uh, Earl the Pearl Monroe shot, you know, fifty percent and above uh, uh, during his time. Uh, you know, I can go on and on and on of, of, of the players, and of course. You know, when I tell the young players that today, you know, they always say, you old relics always think you guys are better than us. Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> but uh, here again, it's the style of play that makes people who they are today. Could Curry have shot the ball that well with us? Absolutely. If we hadn't let him, the first thing we would have done was knocked him down two or three times. 
I know a little bit of something. I know something about that. <laughs> How much fun is my brother, Calvin Murphy? Yeah, I had to borrow a little Murphism, of course. But uh, let's switch gears from a basketball Hall of Famer to a college baseball Hall of Famer, Wayne Graham, who retired from the Rice Owls back in 2018. How about 1,172 wins? Wow. 38 years as a college baseball manager. And I asked Wayne Graham about his brief time as a big leaguer, which led him to cross paths with a couple of legends. But our conversation started off with his early life. I know you you were born in, in Yoakum, Texas, mm -hmm. and then you, you moved to Houston at one point and you played at uh, Reagan High School, right? What, what brought you from Yoakum to, to, to the Houston area? My dad needed a job, so he came to Houston when I was two years old, and, uh, you know, I grew up in all... I'm a public school guy, Sherman Elementary School, a little Marshall Junior High, a little bit at Davis, and then Reagan. You went on to play for UT. You went to play in the major leagues, and I'll t I want to talk to you about that in a little bit. But first, what, what was your team growing up, and who did, who did you watch? What kind of inspired you to get into baseball? Well, I was a Cardinal fan because the farm club here was the uh, Houston Buffs, who were a Cardinal farm club. So I was always a Cardinal fan. That's the reason we've got a jersey now with two uh, – Owls on it uh, in honor of the Cardinals. But uh, my dad was always a Yankee fan, and I wasn't. But uh, mainly, I, I was I pulled for the Cardinals. Do you have a player or two that you were really into it when you were a kid? Everybody loved Musil because he's a great hitter, you know, a great guy and a great hitter. And, you know, I like some of the Yankee players, uh, you know, <laughs> they were pretty good. Mantle and DiMaggio. DiMaggio was a favorite of everybody, and I really admired Joe DiMaggio. You talk about the Yankees when you got a chance to play in the major leagues. You played for one of the most interesting characters and one of the great managers of all time in Casey Stengel. Managed those great Yankee teams. You played for him for a few games with the Mets. I think it was around 20 games or so. What can you tell me about Casey Stengel? What was it like to play for him? We were last place team, so he was more a showman at that time. But if you listen to Casey, nobody knew more baseball than Casey Stengel. I love listening to him because he ran. He did a running commentary on the bench during the game, and I listened to every word he said, and I think it really was valuable information. And then you also played under Gene Mock. You also had a cup of coffee with uh, the Phillies. Between Mock and Stengel, were these the kind of guys that sort of inspired you to later go on and, and coach and manage? Well, I think those two and Bib Falk at Texas, my uh, coach at Texas, you know, was who was stern, but he liked us. He, we knew that. Mock was more of a tactician, strategist, uh, and, uh, of course, Casey was the most personable individual on the planet. I think Dallas Green might have been playing for the Phillies at that time, who was also a great manager. And Bobby Wine managed Dallas Green, Pat Corrales. I played with all of those guys. And Dallas wrote me a nice letter on my thousandth win. I got a nice letter from Dallas Green because we knew each other. Was there a big moment for you at all in all your days in the minor leagues or your time, a little bit of time in the major leagues? Is there something that kind of sticks out uh, for you as a player, a hit, a, 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 an RBI, or just uh, a story? Well, the biggest thing really was they called me out of the minor league camp in 1963. It didn't look like I was ever going to get a chance to play in the big leagues, and they put me in a game. that I arrived late that night. They worked me out that morning, put me in a game, and I went two for two, and that led to me going north with the team. So there you go, a little bit from our own Houston area Yoda, Wayne Graham, who had a grand total of just 55 at-bats in his major league career, only seven hits, batted 127, but what a career as a college manager. In 1992, he inherited a program that had just seven winning seasons in 78 years and only finished above fourth place one time. But from 1995 to 2017, they made 23 straight NCAA tournament appearances, 20 straight conference championships, seven World Series appearances, and an unforgettable national title in 2003. And you've got a hell of a career altogether. And between his stops at San Jack and Rice, he coached guys like Andy Pettit, Roger Clemens, Lance Berkman, and Anthony Rendon. Not a bad legacy at all. I hope everyone enjoyed another Throwback Thursday. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Don't forget to follow Houston Sports Talk on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Podcast app, or the Stitcher app. 
You can support us by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or by telling your friends about us. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening. Oh,